This morning's message is a little bit unusual insofar as it belongs to a series, but it doesn't, but it belongs to two different series. And, and what I mean by that is that over the last several weeks in the season since Easter until now, uh, we've been looking at the farewell discourse of Jesus from John's gospel, his final words to his disciples, uh, especially the most clear and expansive teaching in the New Testament on the coming of the Holy Spirit from the mouth of Jesus and the promise of Jesus' presence that even after he leaves his disciples on earth, that they will not be alone, they will not be orphans, as we read in, fir in the first week. Uh, but this message this morning bridges the gap also too and forms a springboard into our next series from the Gospel of Luke uh, where we're going to look at uh, the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the life of Jesus. And Luke is the, the Gospel writer who focuses a great deal on the Holy Spirit and the power and the work of the Spirit. And this morning's passage, as we'll see later on, is going to form that bridge between the two series. And so this message kind of belongs uh, in the middle of the two, but also overlaps the two as well. Uh, you've probably seen or heard or even reflected on, certainly as you've grown up in, in the church, uh, at some point in time come across this expression of faith versus works. It is, to a degree, uh, the classic theological conundrum for Christians. Uh, and we see it even being played out to a degree in the New Testament. Um, and there are points at which it seems as though the New Testament contradicts itself, that, that James, on the one hand, focuses a great deal on works, where Paul focuses a great deal on faith, and they seem to, at least on the surface, contradict one another. Uh, I'm not going to dive into that whole conversation, uh, and in fact, really, uh, I'm not going to spend a great deal uh, dealing with this conversation this morning uh, in a typical way. Uh, and when we look at this historically and traditionally, it is basically trying to understand what it means to be a Christian and how to live our lives, uh, whether it's faith takes the priority or whether our works take the priority. If you look across the spectrum of Christian churches and, the Christian, and Christian believers, um, you will see that there are some traditions and some people who place a higher emphasis upon faith and a personal relationship with Jesus and not as much um, emphasis upon the things that they do, um, particularly, say, acts of mercy or um, other things, uh, a high level of ethics and obedience uh, elements, uh, but not necessarily a great deal about, say, a missional activity. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, you have folks who focus a great deal on what they do, understanding that, that Christ has done so much for us that, that we need to do something in response to him. And so we see a high level of, of acts of mercy and other uh, acts of obedience, but of course the the dark side of this is what we call legalism, people who feel as though they need to follow all the rules in order to be good Christians. And uh, this battle really has raged on, I would say, for sure since uh, the Reformation, but probably goes, I would say, all the way back to the very early church. It's a struggle for the Christian faith because we fail and, and have a hard time grasping the grace of God and God's uh, predestination and God's calling of us and his work in our lives. And, and that word work, we're going to spend some time focusing on this morning in this message because the work of God and the works of God are done by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, that's our focus for this morning, is the one who bridges the gap between faith and and works, just as this message bridges the gap between our previous series and our next one, but also, too, how the Holy Spirit bridges the gap between our two passages this morning. Our primary passage is from John 14, but our secondary passage is Acts chapter 3, the first miracle, if you will, performed by the apostles after the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. This morning is Pentecost Sunday, the bridging of the gap between the promised coming of the Holy Spirit and the actual work of the Holy Spirit being performed in and through the church in its early days. 
So Jesus promises in John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17, really, the coming of the Spirit for the disciples. Um, and then we see in Acts chapter 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And when Peter gets up and explains to the people who see this amazing event happening, uh, he goes to essentially outline the gospel message in talking about who Jesus is and what happened and and also, too, in part of his explanation of the miraculous things that people are seeing, he stands up and he quotes from the prophet of Joel. And he says, this is in fulfillment of that prophecy, that in that day I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That's the literal rendering of Joel 2.28. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. God is promising in the event of Pentecost to pour out his Holy Spirit, to overflow, to fill his people with his Holy Spirit. But in that same passage, Peter quotes and says that the coming of that Holy Spirit will be displayed through signs and wonders. Signs and wonders, especially signs, are words used often by John in his gospel to speak of the miracles of Jesus. And signs are caught within the broader bracket of works, the works of Jesus. So, how and why is this important and what we're going to dive into? When Jesus says, towards the end of our passage from John 14, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. We see a direct connection there between faith and works. You cannot have one without the other. That is fairly obvious. But to what end? For what purpose? Yes, we can talk about faith and works and that faith and works go together. The Holy Spirit bridges the gap. But to what end? Well, it's all about God's glory. And we see that on the mouth of Jesus, and we'll see that as we dive a little bit more into the text. And so all of this together highlights the importance of having a proper understanding of ourselves, but also, too, a right relationship to Jesus. A right relationship to Jesus that is, in the end, on the basis of faith. Jesus begins his conversation with his disciples in John 14 this way. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Twice there, Jesus says believe. And, and in actuality, in the Greek text, believe in both instances is most likely in the imperative voice, in a command. Uh, there's lots of debate around that, but uh, as I read the text and, and contextually, uh, I would suggest to you that uh, it's not you believe in God, but it's do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And the reason I say that is that in John 14, 11, we see again Jesus says, believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Again, those are both definitely in the imperative voice. And John is very intentional about his structuring of things. Uh, he's very careful and, and very intentional about how he uh, puts his passages together. And so to see believe, believe at the beginning of this conversation and believe, believe towards the end suggests a, a bracketing to me. Um, I'm somewhat alone in this, but I do at least want to point that out to you and say that I find it at the very least interesting, especially when we consider that halfway in between John 14.1 and John 14.11 is John 14.6, which is this. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the most exclusive claim of Jesus in terms of being the only way to salvation. It is, to a degree, the most offensive verse in the entire Bible, insofar as it very clearly paints the picture 
that there is no way to heaven, there is no way to eternal life without a relationship to Jesus Christ. That is the most exclusive, most bold claim in the entire New Testament. So let's piece that together now with the rest of this instruction. As we said, this whole section of John's gospel represents Jesus' final instructions to his disciples. And just prior to John 14, 1, where he says, do not let your hearts be troubled, he says to them, one of you will betray me. He tells them, one of you will be the one who betrays me. And of course, this sets them all emotional and, and in a tizzy. Uh, but as if it wasn't bad enough, then he goes on to say to Peter, um, not only will, you know, you won't be the one who betrays me, but you're going to deny me three times. And, and Peter, you might remember, Jesus renamed the rock. And Peter, the rock, is the one who made the proclamation in Matthew 16 that Jesus, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. This is Peter who's been renamed the rock. And so if the rock, the foundational one, is going to deny Jesus three times. What does that say for the rest of the 12 disciples? So clearly, these disciples are in quite a state. And Jesus carries on the conversation and says, do not be troubled. Do not be afraid. Believe in God. Believe in me. Place your faith. Place your trust in me. And Jesus, if I might paraphrase it, is essentially saying, this is all part of God's plan. I need to go away, but I am going to come back for you. But for now, you can't come with me. But you know the way. And Thomas, who doesn't really say much outside of the Gospel of John, is one of my favorite characters in the Bible for one reason and one reason alone. He's often the one who asks the questions that we wouldn't necessarily dare to ask. Because Jesus isn't exactly being clear here, and so Thomas pipes up and says, but we don't know the way. You're telling us, Jesus, that, that, that we know the way, but we don't know the way. And I'm thankful that, that Thomas is in the Bible because um, this allows Jesus to explain further what he means. And that's where this verse, John 14, verse 6, comes in. Jesus responds, I am the way. So putting that together with the believe, believe in verse 1 and the believe, believe in verse 11 in the context of this conversation, have faith, believe, has very little to do with what we believe in our heads, although that is a part of it. But it has everything to do with trust, with a heart belief. Uh, I've said to you before that um, the word believe in the New Testament can mean believe or have faith or put your trust in. And I've used an illustration, and I'll, I'll repeat it, an illustration of a, a rickety bridge across the canyon. Um, you can say, I believe I can make it across the canyon without plummeting to my death and not actually set foot on it, and you wouldn't be contradicting yourself. But in a biblical sense, to say, I believe that I can make it across and to not set foot on that bridge, that's not faith. That's not faith belief. That's not trust. And that's the kind of thing that Jesus is talking about here. He's warning them. Things are going to get messy. Things are going to get tough. Things are going to get difficult. Believe in God. Believe also in me. It is basing our lives on truth Jesus, who is the truth, the way, the life. And at its very core, as I hope you've seen throughout this series in Easter, at its very core, it's about being in relationship 
to Jesus. But being in relationship to Jesus is not the whole story. Many of us can read John chapter 14, verses 1 through 5, and just simply stop at verse 5. Let me just read that for you again. Where he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Jesus here is promising heaven for his believers. But belief is not just about heaven. Jesus goes on beyond that to talk about so much more, especially towards the end of the passage in verses 12 through 14. And so going to the Father's house is not the whole story here, but it is also about it being displayed through works. It's not just about faith, it's also about works. As we see in other parts of this conversation with Jesus, there is a, a gap. There is going to be a gap between when Jesus leaves his ascension and when he returns. And um, he intends to leave the disciples on to carry on his work. You might remember my message from a couple of weeks ago about Jesus intentionally leaving us behind with a mission, with a plan, with a purpose. And his plan, his purpose, is for us to carry on his work. And as I quoted, and, and I'm going to show you now, uh, verse 12 of John chapter 14 says this, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. In order to understand the fullness of this statement, we need to understand how John uses the word works in his gospel. And I hinted at this in the introduction. The other gospel writers, when they talk about some sort of miraculous thing that Jesus does, they use the Greek word dunamis, uh, which means power, right? Um, uh, dunameo, right? A power or a work or a miracle. But John rarely, if ever, uses the word dunamis. Rather, John uses two other words. He uses the word semeon, which means signs, and ergon, which mean works. And John is very specific in his language choice when he says a sign. A sign is a, a miracle of Jesus that points to a reality beyond itself. The, the turning of the water into wine is a sign. The raising of Lazarus from the dead is a sign. But also in John's gospel, signs are encompassed in Jesus' works. He uses ergon to speak of not only the signs, but also the teaching, the life, everything that Jesus embodies and does. And Jesus says on a couple of occasions in John's gospel that the works that I am doing are the Father's works. And all throughout this passage in John 14 through 17, we see Jesus repeating again and again, I am in the Father, the Father is in me, we are acting together, everything I do, it's because the Father is doing it, and those are the Father's works. So, when Jesus says, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, he is clearly pointing to a continuation of what he started here on earth. That includes preaching and teaching, which we see in Acts chapter 2 when Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit and now emboldened, stands up and preaches the gospel message. But we also see it in miracles. And we see that in Acts chapter 3 where Peter heals the beggar through Jesus. There are many, uh, I don't know how many in our own context, uh, 
who would argue and, and make the point that those miracles, like Peter in Acts 3, that that was only the apostles. Uh, this position is known as cessationism. Uh, and the basic premise is essentially the miraculous works of God through his people were only for a period of time. Uh, it, just to kind of get the ball rolling, to really get the church started and off the ground, but then the miraculous stuff wasn't needed anymore after that. Um, that's not what this text says. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus here says very clearly, whoever believes in me. It's the same wording as when Jesus says, whoever would come after me must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Meaning anyone who places their faith in Jesus, those people for whom Jesus prays towards the end of John 17, those who believe in him through the message of the apostles, it's whoever. These miracles, these events, these works are not confined to the early church. But what was really interesting about this passage and this verse is that Jesus says, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Well, what does he mean? I mean, does he mean greater in, in quantity? Like, as in they will do more great things than I will? My, the scope of my ministry is limited. I can only do certain things, but those after me are going to do more? It's possible, but there are other words in Greek that Jesus and John could have used if they were talking about more. So maybe not greater in quantity. What about greater in quality? I would say that that's a tough thing to argue because that seems to suggest, uh, it seems to diminish uh, and weaken the work of Jesus. To say that his followers will do greater works than his, what greater work could there possibly be than Christ laying down his life for us and sending the Holy Spirit to indwell us. So I don't think it's necessarily about quality. I think the reality is, is that it's a little bit of both. And, and the, the foundation of this, and, and I'm indebted here to uh, D.A. Carson, a commentator and theologian, uh, whose gospel on John is uh, world-renowned as the number one gospel, uh, sorry, commentary on John's gospel. Um, Carson suggests that it is a little bit of both because we need to look at the reason. The last part of this verse is, because I am going to the Father. Because I am going to the Father. You will do greater works than I have, but greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. They are greater by virtue of the fact that Jesus has ascended and that his Holy Spirit is now performing them through his disciples. And Carson sees it uh, along the lines of, of clarity of revelation, if I, if I could use that kind of language. Um, in other words, you know, in Jesus' lifetime, not everyone fully understood. Not everyone grasped it. Not, uh, not many people placed their faith in Jesus. So that's the quantity piece, right? And in Jesus' lifetime, the signs, the Simeon, are veiled. In other words, not everyone understands their, their capability. Not everyone understands uh, what they're actually pointing to. Um, but uh, they are veiled signs, and it's a, a trajectory of, of clarity of, of revelation insofar as after Jesus is ascended and his Holy Spirit is given to the disciples and the disciples then carry on his ministry, um, now the full revelation of what God is doing is known. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ has ascended to God's right hand and the Holy Spirit has come. In, in that effect, other than the new creation and the end of all things in the end, uh, everything else has been accomplished, and so is the, there is now this clearer revelation and understanding. And as a result, more and more people come to faith. We see in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, 3,000 people in a single day 
place their, tra- their trust in Jesus. And then even in verse 47, we see that the Lord continues to add to their number daily those who are being saved. And that work, those works, carry on right up until today. So as we rightly know, and as we can argue theologically, it is not a matter of faith or works, but it is a matter of faith and works. But the nature of the works is not just acts of piety. In other words, the nature of those works, it's not just about good things that we do. It's not just about good things that we do. Those works are the same as Jesus' works that he did while he was on earth. Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, These works invite, summon, point others to Jesus. They're not just good things we do. They're things that bring others and point others to Jesus. That's how those works played themselves out in the book of Acts. That's how those works have played themselves out over the history of the church. And so how do we define these works too? And what are those works? And we're going to look at some of those works in our next series, looking at some of the things that Jesus did empowered by the Holy Spirit in Luke's gospel. But for now, let's close on the reality and the importance of the fact that these particular works are rooted in prayer. Jesus concludes this portion of the discourse with these words. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You will ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. And then this, this is clearly about prayer. Jesus is here talking about prayer. So now let's pick up on something I hinted at and mentioned last week, and you saw it in the children's message just a few moments ago. What does it mean to ask in Jesus' name? I mean, we just by reflex throw that on the end of every prayer that we pray as Christians. Our congregational prayer, our prayers at the meal, at our dinner table, uh, our prayers at night, at bedtime, or in the morning, we conclude all of our prayers with, in Jesus' name, Amen. But how are we using it when we tag it onto the end of a prayer? Are we using it in the way that God intends for us to use it? I mean, you could ask for some of the most selfish things in the world, theoretically. You could pray for things that are clearly outside of God's will and conclude that prayer with in Jesus name amen but that doesn't mean that you're going to get what you prayed for or that God is going to answer that prayer just because you said in Jesus name and I think at the very least this should cause us to pause and think about what we pray for Not to say that our prayers are wrong. Not to say that I think we're praying for the wrong things. But we should be a little bit more cognizant, thinking a little bit more about what it is that we're praying for and why we're praying for it. And this is where understanding what asking in Jesus' name really helps us. To ask for something in Jesus' name is to ask as if Jesus himself is asking it. I'll say that again. To ask for something in Jesus' name is to ask as if Jesus himself were asking it. And I think that just understanding that puts a lot of prayer into perspective. But on the other side of that, 
Jesus promises in John 14, 13, and 14, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. You ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. So what that really says is, we need to understand, we need to know what Jesus' desires are. If our prayers are going to be prayed in such a way that we are asking for something as if Jesus himself were asking it, we better know what Jesus wants. And that brings us back to that whole idea of faith, where we started our message this morning, that it's on the basis of faith, displayed through works and rooted in prayer. In prayer, in reading the scripture, which can be prayer as well, in prayer, that is where we discern, we hear, we come to know, and we come to love God's will. Think about when Jesus' disciples ask him to teach them how to pray. How does he begin that prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The very beginning of that prayer, the very beginning and the essence of every prayer is about submission to and awareness of the will of God. It's not just a matter of, hey, this is what we want, but if it's not your will, God, it's okay. But no, it's, it's asking for God to make known to us what it is that he wants to do through us. And sometimes God doesn't make that very clear to us. I'm still not sure I understand what God is trying to say to us through COVID-19. Many of us are puzzling over that. But just because we don't understand or we don't know, that doesn't mean we shouldn't ask. But there are other times, too, where we know. We know full well what it is that God is asking us to do, but we don't do it. That could be something as simple as, as um, stopping a certain behavior, but it could be something a little bit more scary like stepping out into the mission field, and I'm using a bit of an extreme example there, but other more extreme things of stepping out in faith and sharing our faith with others. Things that we know that God wants us to do, but we're too afraid. So now, all this talk about prayer and name and understanding God's will, let's now take a look briefly at that secondary text from Acts chapter 3. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, if you were Peter, could you have done that? Would you have? This is not free reign to just go out and start finding, you know, crippled people on the street and, and, and saying to them, you know, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. This is not faith healer stuff because that's using the words magically as we see them being misused later in Acts. But no, it's in the name of Jesus means as if Jesus himself were asking it. This is Jesus' desire. And if we are not deeply rooted in prayer and deeply connected to Christ, as it talks about in John 15, we're not going to know the will of God and we're not going to be able to do the works of God. And note the response of the people to this miracle. The people are filled with wonder, 
And this man who is healed, he's jumping and walking and praising God. And that is what the works of God is all about. The works of God point, to, uh, point others to God and bring praise and glory to God. And that is, again, something that is clear time and time and time again throughout John chapters 14 through 17, that it's all about God's glory. This section opens up with that statement, in my Father's house there are many rooms. In other words, there's room for lots of people there. And as Christ continues his works through his people in his world, more and more people get to go to the Father's house. Some questions for you to think about as you go about your day, as you go about your week. Number one, do you believe that you know Jesus well enough to know what his will is? And why or why not? And this is not meant to make you feel bad. This is meant to encourage you and to think about and be reflective. Again, think about how you pray. Are you just using Jesus' name as a magic thing to throw on the end of your own desires? Or are you praying as if you trust and you believe and you know that that's what Jesus would be praying for. Secondly, what works has God done in your life to strengthen your faith? Sometimes they're little things. Sometimes they're big things. Maybe it's something that you've kept to yourself that you've never shared with someone else. I'd encourage you to share it with at least one person. Thirdly, what works might God be calling forth from you in order to bring him glory? This is an invitation to pay attention. To pay attention to what God may be saying in your life right now, what God may be saying to us as a church in this environment. But really just an opportunity to, to really pray, you know, your hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done in me. Do your works through me. And finally, what would encourage you to pray more boldly in Jesus' name? There are certain things that we can pray for in Jesus' name. For example, you know, uh, please bring my neighbor to faith in Jesus' name. That's definitely within the will and the desire of God. But think again about the story of, of Peter with the, the, the lame beggar, where he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. What would it take to get you to have that kind of faith? Let's pray. Father God, uh, we thank you for the, the gift of your Holy Spirit. And we acknowledge and we confess that we don't fully grasp and understand what that promise meant and even what that power means within us. And Father, all too often we limit your work in our lives through lack of faith or even through sins or, or other things. But we pray that now in this moment, as we have been reminded through John's gospel that you intend to do your works through us. You intend to do greater things through us. May you open our hearts, open our minds to know what those things are and fill us and empower us with your spirit to be able to do them. Call us to a deeper level of faith and trust in you that even in the midst of these unprecedented and unusual circumstances, we can not only be led by you, 
but that we can also be empowered by you to do your works in this world for your glory. I pray these things in Jesus' name alone. Amen.